Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Guy Harvey and I'm so glad that you have taken the time to put Reef Go Live event put on by the CCMI. This is a wonderful opportunity for you to be updated on current reef health, health trends, and even ask questions from the scientists while they're underwater. Reefs are an integral part of our marine ecosystem, providing food, shelter, storm protection, sediment support, and so much more. The health of the reef dictates the level of biodiversity that it can sustain, as well as job security for those who rely on it for their livelihood, particularly those of us who are working in the tourism industry. The more people who know about reefs and the role they play, the bigger impact you can have in protecting them. So pay close attention, have fun, and help us to protect our reefs so that they can continue to improve their resilience to environmental changes and provide the services needed for all of us to survive. Happy World Ocean Day. Thank you. This World Ocean Day, I pledge the I pledge. 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 We pledge. I pledge. I pledge. I pledge to protect coral reefs and the global ocean for future generations. We're standing up for coral reefs. I pledge to consider the impact I have on the marine environment in my daily life. Reducing my footprint where possible. To ensure we have diverse and vibrant coral reefs. And a healthy world ocean for the future. Eu comprometo-me a proteger os recifes de coral e os oceanos para as gerações futuras. Me comprometo a proteger os arrecifes de coral. Je m'engage a proteger les recifes de coral. Me comprometo a proteger os recifes de coral. for joining us and being our virtual dive buddies from all around the world. On today's episode, we are going to be standing up for reefs. We're celebrating World Ocean Day by looking at the reefs we have here in Little Cayman. We're going to look at how they're doing, how they're changing because of human action, and what that means now and going into the future. 
Our discussion is going to be based on over 20 years of surveys here on Little Cayman's Reefs, and the results actually give us a really interesting story, especially when we're talking about the shifts in different dominating corals on the reefs that we have. We have seen some encouraging results, especially when we talk about fish populations, specifically parrotfish or other herbivorous fish, and the link decrease in algal life on our reefs. So whilst reefs around the world are facing more threats than ever before, we are actually encouraged by signs of hope and the ability of certain things to adapt and survive, which we desperately need going into our future. So whilst we explain all of this in a little bit more detail, we will be taking your questions live and answering them from underwater. Hopefully we can see some cool life around the dive site as a bonus. So today we're broadcasting live from Meadows, which is a lovely dive site here in the Bloody Bay Marine Park, just off the coast of Little Cayman, which you can probably see behind me, which is a tiny island in the Caribbean with a population of fewer than 200 people. I'm Fiona, I'm your top side host for today, and I'll be heading out the conversation with CCMI's Director of Research, Dr. Gretchen Goodbody Gringley. She's going to be answering her questions live from underwater, wearing special scuba gear, which includes a microphone and headphones. Uh, so let's take a moment now to say hi to Dr. Gretchen. Hi, everybody. We're so happy to have you here to watch Reefs go live today. I'm Dr. Gretchen Goodbody Gringley, and I'm happy to talk to you about the health of the coral reefs here in the Cayman Islands today, how that compares to what they were like in the past, and what we can predict about how they will respond in the future and how we can protect them. Thank you, Dr. Gretchen. Now, we also have a whole team of other people above water, below water, and behind cameras. So you might hear Dr. Gretchen and I checking in with the camera people and producers, Tom, Gabby, Lars, and Beth. Hi, guys. Hi. So a couple of things I want to mention right off the bat is uh, we love to hear your questions, so please go ahead and ask us questions. If you're watching this online, you can do so by dropping your questions or comments in the chat box to the right-hand side of your screen. And if you're watching from the Kamana Bay Cinema, you can WhatsApp us in your questions and we will see them. If you could include your name, your age, and your location, which could be the city, state, country, wherever, uh, that's going to really help us when it comes to responding to your questions. If you're not already subscribed, you can do so by hitting that big red button on the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, and you can register through our website for more research specific material. You'll probably hear me checking in on the Dr. Gretchen and the rest of the underwater team throughout the broadcast. If any of you out there are divers, you'll know this is completely normal and nothing to be concerned about. It's just a safe diving practice. So let's go ahead and do that now. Dr. Gretchen, how are you and the team doing down there? We're doing great down here, Fiona. We're excited to get started. Great, Dr. Gretchen. That's what we like to hear. So if you watched our previous two reefs go live, you'll know that we shared some of the amazing biodiversity we have here on our reefs. We discussed why that biodiversity was so important. We talked about some major threats facing coral reefs and the impact that human activity has had on those reefs. What all of us can do to have a better impact. Today, we're gonna to be looking at the changes that we have seen and comparing reefs now with how they were 10, 20, and even thousands of years ago, and then discussing what those differences mean to us. Dr. Gretchen, do you have anything to add to that? Sure, Fiona. We're also going to be discussing what scientists at CCMI are doing. We'll get years and years of data and also create new experiments in order to understand how coral reefs will continue to respond in a warming ocean. Visuals can do to help protect coral reefs. Exactly, Dr. Gretchen, and we're also going to be asking all of our dive buddies to stand up for coral reefs by using our words and our actions to make a difference. So to start off, we're going to take a quick look way back in time to when the Cayman Islands formed as part of an underwater mountain range, and they rose out of the ocean millions of years ago. So in between the sandy beaches that we are known and loved for here in the Cayman Islands, we have stretches of shoreline called Iron Shore. Now in this iron shore, you can actually find fossilized remains of the corals that existed and helped form these islands millions of years ago. The amazing thing about this is that actually using those fossilized remains of coral, as well as coral skeletons that wash up on our beaches and even living coral on our reefs today, we can create a really clear record of what the climate was like and the ocean was like at these distinct times. 
Dr. Gretchen, could you explain this a little bit more? Yeah, well, in fact, palm corals, like this beautiful Orbisella colony in front of me, quite a calcium carbonate skeleton. The skeleton is similar to our bones and our teeth. Scientists that have collaborated with CCMI have found skeletons of these corals washed up on the beach. They have been present for over 800 years. And in fact, some of those coral skeleton individuals were found to have been 75 years old. We also know that corals like these have existed on Caribbean coral reefs for over 2 million years. In fact, some coral skeletons, similar to the species that we see around me now, have dated back over 6,000 years old. It's fascinating how we can find out so much about our planet's history by looking at the coral skeletons that wash up, as well as those fossilized corals that we see in the Iron Shore. So scientists can analyze those coral skeletons, as well as core samples like this one right here, which is quite heavy, right here. So this is a core sample that was taken from the reef with permission from the Department of Environment. And they can use them to understand what the sea temperatures were like and when there were big storms. And they to put all this together to create a really nice picture of what the ocean was like at that time. Because of this, we actually know that some large boulder corals like that Orbicella species that Dr. Gretchen pointed out earlier, uh, also sometimes known as star coral, that's a common name, they actually survived major changes in, in the ocean climate millions of years ago when a bunch of other very similar species died out. So as most of you know, uh, we are experiencing rapid climate change caused by humans which means the species on our reef are shifting because of the changes in marine environment, particularly the rising water temperatures. Scientists, students, and people all around the world are concerned with how this will affect life as we know it on our coral reefs. So as our global climate changes, life is changing on reefs. How do we understand what sort of changes are taking place? Yeah. We actually have to use long-term studies and continuous surveys of the reef in order to really see these shifts and trends and patterns that we see because it's not immediately obvious to a casual observer or even to a scientist right away. Only by looking at a lot of data over a long period of time can we start to discern what's really happening on a coral reef and understand our impacts and begin to predict and plan for what coral reefs will be like in the future. And it is exactly for these reasons that CCMI scientists have been conducting annual surveys on fish, coral, and algal life since 1999. These surveys allow us to assess the status of health on the reef at the time of the survey, as well as being able to compare how different aspects of the reef are faring. So from data sets like this, with over 20 years of monitoring, allow us to see shifts that are happening more gradually and slowly over time. Dr. Gretchen, could you give us an example of this? Sure. One great example is that in a long-term survey data, we found a shift in species composition from large, beautiful boulder corals like this Orbisella to other corals such as this Parites, or finger coral, and an Agaricea, which is a lettuce coral. So this is the Agaricea, which is here. If you look here. And down below here is the Parites, the finger coral. Thank you, Dr. Gretchen. And could you explain why this shift of species is meaningful? You know, what's really interesting is that these orbicellids, as you can see, form massive boulder colonies, and they can be huge. In comparison, the other two species we just looked at, the Agarusia and the Parites, they form much smaller colonies, and these colonies aren't as important in terms of reef building. So when we see a shift in the size of corals overall over many years, this may be because we're seeing a shift in species composition on the reef. It could also be because perhaps the overall population is made up of younger individuals. Alternatively, maybe there's been some fragmentation from storage. 
storms or bleaching or disease. And so that's resulting in smaller individuals. But really, it's probably a combination of all these things. Thank you, Dr. Gretchen. So we need coral reefs to continue to be the large, complex, strong stru structures that they are to provide that same important function that we rely upon them for. So if the corals that are making up our reefs are smaller rather than growing or maintaining their size, this is a sign that the reefs are actually struggling. Smaller corals are less ideal homes for various fish and marine species, and that same loss of large, strong structure means we have less protection from big storms and the giant storms that are happening much more frequently due to a rapidly changing climate. But some of the coral survey data was actually quite positive. So whilst there was a shift in species composition uh, of coral that we see on our reefs towards the smaller end, we actually did see an increase in the reef that was covered by coral uh, since 2019. If we look at the percentage of coral covering going back to 1999, we actually see this very interesting cyclical pattern start to emerge, with coral cover increasing and then decreasing over time. Dr. Gretchen, could you tell us some more about that? Yeah, well, when we talk about coral cover, we're actually looking at a very small portion of the reef, maybe a section like this here in front of us. And what we're doing is we're quantifying what we see in this section of the reef. So how much of this section is actually live coral? How much is dead coral? How much is algae? How much is sand? And so on. And by doing this, we've actually seen a shift in species abundance over time. And so we have this cyclical pattern. And we think probably what we're seeing could be reflective of disturbance, recovery, and recruitment. Put more simply, it's possible that the corals that we were seeing on a reef in 1999 experienced a disturbance that led to decline. After this disturbance is removed, the reef begins to recover, baby corals settle down onto the substrate, grow into large adult corals again, and the cycle continues. Yes, it's such an interesting cycle and one that we only know about because of all the long-term surveys that we've been conducting. So, when we see an increase in coral cover and a decrease in algae, as we did in 2020, what else does this tell us about our reefs? Well, the decrease in algae, Fiona, is so important. Any increase that potentially the herbivorous fish population here in Little Cayman is thriving. And in fact, our long-term data actually showed this. We found a significant increase in the abundance of fish on our reefs since 1999. And specifically, we found a significant increase in parrotfish. And this is really critical because parrotfish are probably the most important herbivore on the reef. They eat so much of all this algae that you can see just in front of us growing on the rocks here, all these little brown bits uh, in between the corals. This is consumed by parrotfish. And what's important about this is as they consume this algae, they're creating space for baby corals to recruit and grow and survive. And that's because corals and algae are in direct competition for space. So the recovery of the parrotfish is a great sign for the health of our coral reefs. Yes, it's great news that the fish populations are rebounding here, as you mentioned. And it means that protection is being put in place by the Cayman Islands Department of Environment, like the marine protected area that we're in right now, as well as protected species, catch limits, size limits, and designated seasons for fishing do actually work in the long term. We were also super encouraged by analyzing the overall health of our reefs in 2020. So over, over the years, the health of the reefs we've surveyed have been classified as fair, good, or good plus. But not since 2010 did we have a reef or a site that could be classified as being in very good health. In 2020, a higher percentage of sites classified than ever before were considered to be in very good reef health. And it reminds me that not only are we celebrating World Oceans Day, we're also celebrating the first anniversary of Little Cayman being named as a hope spot by Mission Blue. CCMI was so proud to champion Little Cayman as a hope spot because we really do believe that the healthy reefs here, the biodiversity, and the beautiful natural state of the environment, both above and below the water, provide hope for all of us for the future of our planet.
Thank you, Gretchen. And actually, to demonstrate that, is there any cool life you can see around you at the moment? You know, there are a lot of cool things around us here tonight. Today, sorry. <laughs> I have some really great corals, some mycetophilia, some agaricias. We have a little fairy basslet in front of us, which is one of my most favorite species of fish. It's just so beautiful and really abundant all around Cayman. You know, there is, in fact, also a little resident reef shark that we see on almost every dive here at Meadows. So we're hoping that at some point in the broadcast, he's going to make an appearance and come past us. That would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, sure uh, We would. do have a quick question that's just come in from a chinked from Northside. I'm very sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. And they have asked, what do corals eat slash live on? What do they live on? And eat. Oh, okay. So that's a great question. Thank you. So corals, in fact, can eat little tiny things swimming around in the water. They are made up of hundreds or thousands of little tiny polyps that look like sea anemones. And so all of these little polyps have tentacles and they can grab tiny little things swimming past and consume them like this. But they are also very dependent on light. And that's because they have an algae symbiont living inside of their tissue. So a lot of the energy that they get is in fact produced by photosynthesis from that algae that lives inside of them. Thank you, Dr. Gretchen. That was a great answer. Um, so as you can see from what you just showed around you and the coral around you, there's so much amazing life here on our reefs. And in the face of so many challenges, we're always so happy to have positive news like that to share. But when we do consider this, alongside the results from a bunch of other surveys, we do actually see that changes are taking place. So Little Cayman is not as directly affected by negative human impacts because our population here is so, so small. But we are still impacted by global and regional changes. Like, for example, the sea temperature rising and uh, corals being stressed by different heat and diseases. Uh, we also have fish being taken from our ocean unsustainably and tons of plastic pollution washing up on our shores from elsewhere. Because of this, you can see that even in a remote location like this, we are still being affected. And these challenges require everyone to make changes to their behavior since we all depend on the health of our coral reefs. We are going to speak a little bit more about this in a minute, but first I want to talk about what researchers at CCMI are doing. So when we look to the future, we want to understand what coral reefs are going to look like and how they can possibly provide the important services that we all are. Scientists want to know how key coral species will fare if the water temperatures continue to rise. Dr. Gretchen, can you explain to our buddies how we can conduct experiments to figure that out? Most definitely. So, one of the types of experiments I conduct is using little chambers like this. We'll take a piece of the coral from the reef, and in this instance for today, just for demonstration, we're using a dead coral skeleton from a previous experiment. So we put the corals in the chamber, bring them back into the lab, and we expose them to a very broad range of temperatures. And whilst doing this, we're actually measuring the oxygen that they consume over time under these different temperature regimes. This tells us how much oxygen they actually need in order to survive under different temperatures. So we can create these beautiful curves and they'll tell us what's the optimal temperature for a coral to survive in, but also what is the maximum temperature that a coral can tolerate. We can then select individuals that perform well under higher temperatures and use them in our restoration activities and output them onto the reef to create more robust and resilient coral reefs for the future. It's so interesting, Dr. Gretchen. It's so cool that we can do that. We also just wanted to say a quick hello to Diving with Heroes and to Katie and Nick in Guatemala. Hi, guys. Nice to see that you are tuning in. So actually, what Gretchen was saying, at CCMI, we're also putting this into practice by testing the ability of individual corals in our nursery at CCMI. Uh, see if they can adapt.
out in five increased water temperature and then taking these corals and outplanting them in the hopes that we can grow hardier, more resilient coral, and these can survive better and help contribute to the success of the reefs for generations to come. So while scientists are hard at work making the future possible, let's talk a little bit about how this relates to our dive buddies online. Well, we, we really hope that our dive buddies joining us today can not only appreciate the beauty of the underwater world that we're showing them here, also its importance. Coral reefs have been around for millions of years, only right out of our human impact. So it's important that we as individuals take, do our part to ensure that they are around in the future. Well said, Dr. Gretchen. So let's go ahead and sure if we can all reduce our negative impact on coral reefs. So you can all reduce your carbon footprint by shifting away from single-use plastic and trying to use objects that can have many, many uses. Uh, we can use reusable water bottles, like this one I got here. Just you can take this with you everywhere you go. It's a very simple thing that we can all do. You can also bike or carpool instead of driving yourself everywhere you need to go. Um, you can recycle any plastic metal or glass waste that you're unable to completely remove from your routine, and you can also just eat a more plant-based and locally sourced diet. There's so many ways that we can all protect our oceans for generations to come, so as we celebrate World Ocean Day, we want to ask everyone in our audience to stand up for reefs and take our pledge with us to help do your part to protect the marine environment. Dr. Gretchen, do you have anything to add to that? Sure. One of the most important things that you can do to help protect coral reefs is to use your own voice. Share what you know about corals and why they're so important. If you're making a change in your life, encourage your friends or family to join you and do the same. We can all be proud of the little things that we do every day to help the life on our planet. And we can also challenge ourselves to do a little bit more. Thank you, Dr. Gretchen. That sentiment is so true and so important. So we all need to remember that. We do have another question that's just come in. And someone has asked, how do coral reproduce and how long does it take? Great question. So, one way that corals can reproduce is actually storms so of a colony like this gets broken off and ends up being lodged into the reef somewhere else. That, in fact, is a mechanism for reproduction. But another way that corals reproduce is that they actually produce gametes, or sperm and eggs. And those gametes fuse to form little larvae. They're teeny, teeny tiny little things that swim around in the water column because they're covered in little tiny hairs that allow them to move. Those little larvae will then settle down onto a bare space on the reef, transpose or metamorphose into a tiny little baby coral, and then grow up and replicate and form a beautiful coral colony like what we see. Now this can take 10 years to form a decent sized colony, or hundreds of years. As we said before, some corals can live up to 75, 80 years, even a few corals have been known to live over 100 years. Thank you, Dr. Gretchen. It is so interesting, and so many people don't know much about corals, so it is important we all continue to educate ourselves on that and spread awareness. We do have another question that's just come in from Lucas, who's nine, who wants to know what the maximum temperature that corals can withstand is. Well, live pretty close to the highest temperature that they can tolerate. So even just a change of one degrees can cause corals to bleach and potentially die. So, to answer your question, it actually depends on where the coral lives. There are some corals that live in very hot, high pool areas of the wild that can live in waters that are up to 40 degrees Celsius. But for the most part, corals in the Caribbean stand about 31 to 32 degrees Celsius. Thank you, Dr. Gretchen. We have another question here. So 
Mia Jordan, aged 7, wants to know, do hurricanes destroy the live corals? Sometimes hurricanes can, in fact, have a really negative impact on coral reefs. A long time ago, for some of you, maybe not for some of us, there was a hurricane that was called Hurricane Andrew. It came up through the Peruvian, up the coast of Florida, and caused major damage to the reefs, in particular in Jamaica, and some of our large, branching, beautiful Acropora corals were destroyed during that hurricane. So yes, depending on the strength of the hurricane, it can in fact have a negative impact on coral. Thank you, Dr. Gretchen. We have a few more questions coming in for you. So Eden has asked, what are the correlations between mangroves and reef health? Oh, cool. Uh, mangroves are very important to coral reef health. And in fact, that's primarily because of the fish. So mangroves serve as a nursery ground for juvenile fish species of all different kinds of species. So when, a, when the fish are tiny little babies, they go into the mangrove because it's safe. There's not a lot of predators there to eat them. So they hide out there until they grow to a size that's big enough that they feel safe to come out onto the reef. So in all our healthy mangroves, we wouldn't have a healthy fish population. Thank you, Dr. Gretchen. And we have another question for you. So, Steph wants to know if some cor corals can be harmful. Well, that's an interesting question because it depends on harmful to whom. So, corals, of course, can be harmful to us if we touch them. Some of them have stinging cells in them that can hurt if you get stung by a coral. Some corals, in fact, fight with one another, and they create these giant tall tentacles that will actually go out and swing back and forth and try and attack the coral that's coming in close to it or a sponge that's coming in too close to it. So I guess in that sense, sometimes corals can be dangerous. Thank you, Dr. Gretchen. So a bunch of questions. Um, another question from Aiden, who is seven, who wants to know, are corals strong or weak? Are corals strong or, sorry, strong or weak? Ah. Well, I think that corals are strong. They've been around for several million years. I hope they're going to stick around and be with us for several more million years as our planet continues to evolve and change. But they're also quite fragile because they have evolved in an environment that makes them so close to their tolerance of what they can survive in. They have a very narrow range of tolerance. So in that sense, they're actually quite fragile. Thank you, Dr. Gretchen. And Jack, who is five from South Sound, wants to know if there are more species of shark in Little Cayman than Grand Cayman. Well, not necessarily more species sharks, but I would say that we probably see more sharks here in Little Cayman than we do in Grand Cayman. And I think Dr. Guy Harvey could probably help answer that question more specifically than me, but he has told me that we often see sharks here in Little, that he doesn't see as frequently in Grand Cayman. So perhaps they just spend a little bit more time over here than they do over there. Thank you, Dr. Gretchen. Uh, we have a couple more questions here. So Holly and Henry want to know, do we get bull sharks in Little Cayman? Question. So in fact, <laughs> Uh, a few weeks ago, we were diving off the south side here, and I saw a really big reef shark. And I came back, and I was like, that had to be a bull shark. It was so big and fat. And so, of course, um, we get bull sharks here. Apparently, we do, but they are very, very rare, so it's unlikely that you will see a bull shark here. Thank you, Dr. Gretchen. Yeah, it would be very cool if we could see a bull shark here. And the reef sharks we see do get huge, so we are lucky with that. Uh, another quick question. So Jack from the UK has asked, how do corals keep growing? 
corals grow by laying down more and more skeleton and actually only the living tissue. Thank you so much, Dr. Gretchen. So that is about it for today. We want to thank you all so much for joining us and those were some fantastic questions at the end, guys. Thank you all so much for sending those in. We hope you learn a little bit more about how life shifts in response to environmental changes on reefs and how scientists are studying those changes. We also discussed how scientists are trying to use their knowledge of coral reef adaptations so that the coral reefs stick around in the future. And then we spoke about a few simple ways that everyone can pitch in. So thanks so much for being our virtual dive buddies and for being interested in coral reefs. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click that little bell icon to receive notifications about future CCMI videos. And thank you again, everyone. We hope you're inspired to take our pledge to stand up for reefs with CCMI this World Ocean Day.